Good morning. If you're calling from a phone number ending in 4133, can you please state your name? Hi, Easter. It's Drew. Hi, is that you on 4133? Yeah, I'm trying. Okay. For, for whatever reason, when I logged into Zoom, it didn't give me the option to dial in. It just went straight to my computer audio, and that does not work. I just don't have computer audio. Okay, perfect. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to verify we captured everyone. Yeah, no, I'm glad you did that. I was trying to email you. Drew, just so you know, you're unmuted. So if you wanted to mute yourself, you can go ahead. I didn't want to do that for you just in case. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Drew McIntyre. We're going to just give a little bit more time to get some other folks joining in. So, so far from the CAC, I see um, Kent with Petaluma, uh, Paul Sellier with Moran Municipal. Craig Scott with Katati.
Yeah, this is a uh, pardon. I just want you to know Jennifer is going to be just a few minutes late. Okay, thanks, Peter. All right, so I'm just, so right now we've got four for the TAC members plus Marin Municipal. So we're just waiting for Town of Windsor, City of Sonoma, Runner Park, Valley of the Moon. Drew, this is Sandy Potter. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. okay. <laughs> Windsor is here. Thank you. And Drew, this is Drew, this is Mary Grace. Hi, Mary Grace. Okay. Drew Fergie's in the meeting too, from Sonoma. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right, we're good then. Um, well, happy Monday, everybody. Uh, welcome to the October fifth TAC meeting and uh, virtual meeting again. So we're going to follow through the the protocols again. Thanks to Easter and Gina, especially for putting together the the logistics each time. It's a lot of extra work and it's certainly appreciated. So um, first thing I'd like to do is uh, ask Easter. Easter, can you go ahead and do a roll call for the TAC members, please? Yes. City of Katati. Here. If you don't mind stating your first and last name as well, please. Craig Scott. Thank you, Craig. City of Petaluma. Hi, Kent Carruthers for the City of Petaluma. City of Brunner Park. Uh, Mary Grace Pawson for the City of Brunner Park. City of Santa Rosa. This is Martin, this is alternate. City of Sonoma. Colleen Ferguson with City of Sonoma. North Marin Water District. Drew McIntyre. Town of Windsor. Sandy Potter with the Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. I have Matt Polner here, Valley of the Moon. Marin Municipal Water District. Uh, Paul Sellier, Marin Municipal. Okay, in just one moment, and I will read off the staff and public attendees. We have Pam Jean, Don Seymour, Stephen Hancock, Jay Disperse, Colin Close, Barry Dugan, Bob Anderson, Brad Sherwood, Brian Kilkenny, Chelsea Thompson, Claire Nordley, David Keller, Dick, Margaret D. Genova, Paul Piazza, and Paul Selsky. Okay, thank you, Easter. Um, item or agenda item number two, public comment. So uh, I'm opening it up now to public comment. Uh, these are item, These are for items that are not on the agenda. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, uh, please dial star nine to raise your hand. So I'll just give a pause here. If there's anybody on Zoom or calling in, uh, and then Gina, if you can just let me know if you see anybody. Drew, I do not see any raised hands. Okay. Thank you, Gina. Uh, item number three, uh, 2020 water production relative to 2013 benchmark. So that will be me uh, in the agenda. As we typically do, uh, we have a chart that essentially, or a tabulation initially in tables one and two, that shows water use uh, for the uh, Sonoma Marin Weight Saving Water Partnership. Uh, table one is for August, just for the month. Table two is year-to-date usage. And then there's a chart 
at the bottom that shows uh, the deliveries over time as well as GPCD. Uh, you'll see here in, for the month of August, um, it was 4%, uh, total water deliveries were 4% below the 2013 benchmark. Uh, table two, which is much more uh, consistent and not so much variable from a month to month. So it just, this looks at uh, savings to date for the partnership over the year. It's again, 11% down from the 2013 benchmark. And as we have repeated on a regular basis, uh, as shown in chart two, uh, the overall water use has dropped down significantly, you know, above and beyond just 2013. You can look at water usage back in the uh, early 2000s, late 1990s, uh, the graph of GPCD gallons per day per capita and shows that uh, water use has been declining uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, and 2013 certainly was not uh, by any means the highest water use production. We just have used that to match up with what the state was using um, when they did the 2015, after the 2015 drought and, and uh, reporting by the water, water users at that time. Any questions at all from the TAC on this data? Okay, I don't see any information, any questions at all from the TAC. Moving to the public, um, take any comments on this item. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine if you're, um, participating via telephone. Gina, have you noticed any any public that wanted to comment on this item? Yes, we do have one public speaker, David Keller. Let me allow you to speak. Okay, please go ahead. Good morning. Thank, um, thank you. I just wanted to do uh, two things. One is I wanted to thank the water agency and staff for being able to keep the system running uh, during the fires. Uh, an incredible job, really a lot of thanks and gratitude um, for the system is running. And uh, with that, I wanted to double check, is uh, water that is supplied through hydrants for firefighting, is that included in the water production? Um, and what does that do to the gallons per capita per day? So, uh, thanks for the thanks for the comment first, uh, David. And we will have some more discussion on the fire impacts later on. And, and regarding your question, yeah, this this data here is total production, so it's total water delivered by all the all the water contractors for everything. So that would include. Uh, not only metered water, but unmetered water. Uh, so obviously firefighting, you know, a, a good percentage, in fact, most of the water I would, I would um, surmise, you know, is, is not metered by the different water contractors for firefighting. Um, so yeah, that, that is part of this total. And in terms of gallons per day per capita right now, that's essentially that that shows up. That's that's included as well, because essentially it's the total production divided by the population uh, by all the contractors so that uh, any firefighting water would show up in, in the GPCD as well. Okay, thank you. Gina, were there any other questions on item 3A? I'm not seeing any additional hands. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to item 3B. This is an update on the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan and Colin Close with the City of Santa Rosa, who's the uh, committee chair um, on this effort, will go ahead and give an update. Colin? Good morning, Drew. Thank you. Everybody able to hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, terrific. 
so the preliminary work obviously is behind us. Data collection has been completed. Uh, the, there's been a couple of draft memos, tech memos that have been produced that folks have provided their comments on. So I, again, I just wanna thank everybody. I realize this has been a tremendous amount of work and often with very tight timelines and uh, everybody has a lot of other responsibilities and pressures and the emergencies and COVID, et cetera. So I just wanna thank everybody for uh, doing all the hard work you've done to help us be on track as much as possible. Um, the regional conservation uh, demand uh, projections have been drafted. Everyone has provided their comments and corrections to uh, some of the assumptions and the analysis. So we should be getting the final draft from EKI, I believe in about two weeks at the most. So we should be able to get those fairly soon. Uh, and then also they have quite a bit of other work to do in terms of looking at the water conservation measures that all of us have been implementing and what are the water savings that we've realized to date? What are the projected water savings for three different scenarios? And EKI is working hard on those and we expect to see those by the, the uh, final, I'm sorry, a draft of the entire report, including the water conservation measures uh, right at the end of October potentially the beginning of November. Uh, there are maybe one or two folks who still are gonna get a couple of pieces of information to EKI about that so that they can proceed with all of that. So uh, I don't know exactly how long it will take all of us to review the final draft or the, excuse me, the draft full report. So I can't say exactly when the final reports will be delivered, but we are moving along. And again, it's thanks to everybody who has work so hard with some very tight turnaround times to help us get caught back up with our timeline. Uh, in terms of being able to provide demand projections to the water agency, um, I think that will probably be within a week or two. Uh, we need to do some internal discussions about what our local supplies are. Some of that discussion needs to still occur and be finalized, but uh, we're, again, we're very close to having the projections from EKI, and then we need to make sure that we've uh, finalized our local production data and put that all together as a package and provide that to the water agency. So apologies for the delays. Uh, to the water agency and the GSA, all, all three GSAs actually, but thank you again to all the partners for working so hard on this despite all the many challenges we've faced. And I'm happy to take any questions if folks need more detail. Thanks, Colin. Uh, questions from the TAC on Colin's report? Colin, I, I have a quick question. Um, Anything, any updates that you have on just the, the guidebook? Uh, been... Yeah, sorry to cut you off there, Drew. Go ahead and finish. Yeah, just I just I know that the, there's been some meetings of late and the, the comments on the guidebook. I just wondered if you had any update on that as well. At this point, we have a full draft of the guidebook available to us. So many of us have been utilizing that as we move forward because it's not anticipated there will be major changes from the draft to the final. Um, so we've, we were able to see early drafts of some of the chapters. Now we have a full draft of the full guidebook. Um, Santa Rosa didn't have any major comments to submit. I don't know if others did. Uh, there's also been a work group that's been held. And so we were able to talk with them in detail about um, some of the elements of that. There'll be another work group coming up. So, uh, so far, I think they're on track for November, uh, but I don't actually know for certain. I think the other piece of it will be the tables. Uh, the tables they provide are um, for our use if we choose to, they're not mandatory, but they are used to upload to the WUI portal that they have. So uh, while they don't have to show up in our urban water management plans, they do have to be utilized for uploading our our data to the portal. So uh, I'm not sure exactly when those will be finalized. Uh, hopefully the, they are on the same timeline. Okay, thanks Colin. And just I, as, the, as I'm sure the group is aware, you know, the urban water management plan is, is due at the end of June, 2021. Uh, just an update on North Marin, you know, we, the last couple times we've done our plan in-house and, and given everything that's been going on lately just here at the at North Carolina Water District and staffing levels, we actually just 
uh, went to the board and the board approved a contract and EKI will, will be uh, being brought under contract to, uh, to prepare the urban water management plan for us. So just want to pass that on. Uh, now it's time to ask for any questions from the comments on this item, the 2020 Urban Water Management Plan update. Uh, if you wish to make a comment, please raise your hand in Zoom. Or also, if you're participating by phone, dial star nine. And I did see Jay raising your hand. Thanks, Drew. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention from the from the groundwater sustainability perspective on this topic um, that each of the groundwater three groundwater sustainability agencies have scheduled board meetings in the end of October um, to present a proposal for a 50 year forecast uh, that we are required under Sigma to conduct. And um, there's several components to that, including climate scenarios as well as future water demand projections reaching out to 50 years. And so um, I, I key part of this will be the projections that we're going to use the M&I <clears throat> uh, from the uh, urban water management planning effort, at least through the 25 years. And then we're going to have to um, uh, work with each of you uh, fairly short order uh, to figure out a methodology to uh, extend it out from 25 to 50 years. And I know this is, it's crazy to look at 50 year forecasts, um, but that is what's required in the law. So we will need to work with each one of you individually, um, fairly short order um, before the, um, uh, the, the, towards the end of August or October, uh, where we have to present these, um, forecast uh, scenarios for each of the three boards. So I just wanted to emphasize that. And we look forward to working with uh, all of you, at least who are in the uh, Sonoma County contractors. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Any questions for Jay? Uh, Gina, any other questions on this agenda item 3B from the public? Not from the public, but I do see Sandy Potter with her hand raised. Hi, Sandy. It's all yours. Hi, I just wanted to thank Colin for his incredible patience and support for us gathering the um, data. We really appreciate it and the great work that EKI is doing. And Marcus um, has been super helpful in getting the groundwater um, data together for the work that Jay mentioned. So I just want to thank all the staff who are helping out um, the smaller cities. All right, great. Any other questions on this topic? Okay, next item on the agenda is agenda item number four, Sonoma County fires update on impacts to water facilities from the glass and wall bridge fires. And Jay, are you gonna handle this one? Yeah. I'll I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, you know, uh, uh, two major topics I'll just touch on. One is our facilities. Um, and then second, um, the post-fire uh, impacts and risk assessments that um, we are um, involved with um, as we've become all too familiar with and experienced with over the last three or four years. First on our facilities, um, you know, all our facilities are continue to operate and continuously. Um, the, uh, the glass fire, uh, of course, posed some issues um, and some, some threats, especially on the Eastern Santa Rosa and Northern Sonoma Valley. Um, I think the two biggest uh, issues were Sonoma Booster Station uh, last, late last Sunday night, early Monday, um, we're in the middle of, I think everybody knows of a significant um, capital project on that important facility. And, and right as we were going to do some testing uh, early last week, um, the impacts of the fire and a, and a power outage, Pam's and Mike Thompson's uh, staff did a, a, an incredible job in getting the generators out there and working and really um, 
um, continue to see reliable operations out of that facility during the uh, the uh, highest threat impact uh, from the glass from the glass fire. Um, and so kudos uh, to them uh, for the incredible work that they did. <clears throat> and then um, the Los Gilbert tank, uh, the fire um, did impact that area, but uh, my understanding is the tank has continued to operate um, and uh, there aren't any impacts. I, um, I don't know, before I turn to watersheds, Pam or Mike, do you have any other um, input on, on that? No, um, thanks for the acknowledgement, Jay. Our crews, once again, sort of did their yeoman's work and really um, did a great job keeping us going. And we were very fortunate that that fire didn't blow through where the Sonoma Booster Station is. That would have been disastrous for us. Um, and um, it did, however, um, Jay alluded to this a little bit, it did actually burn right through our Anadel 2 tank site, which is at Los Gilicos. It's on the north side of Highway 12 near the Los Gilicos facilities there where the juvenile detention facility is. Um, because of uh, the amount of maintenance that was done, vegetation maintenance, um, and just keeping that site clean, it just blew right through there and didn't touch anything. So even some of the, um, plastic PVC type fittings that were on the outside of, um, you know, exposed um, weren't damaged. So we're really happy with that. Um, and it, that, that site got very much cleaned up after the 2017 fires. Um, and that certainly made a huge difference. So um, we're really happy about that. Um, we did um, have some good success also with some new installation. We used to, um, when we had fires like this and lost power, we would lose communications to some of our tank sites. And since um, 2017, we've installed a number of um, solar powered communication systems out at our tank sites. We, the first one that got installed was at Los Gilicos at Anadol 2 to try it out as a pilot and it worked really well. So we're putting them all over the place now, but um, that did keep us in communications the entire time. Had this been three years ago, we would have lost communications there. So, um, but we did not this time. So um, anyways, it's great job on everybody's part. Um, really appreciate it. Fergie. I just wanted to thank Sonoma Water for um, keeping the water flowing down Sonoma Valley and keeping us informed so that we could do what we could to minimize water usage during the time when the water was not flowing until the generators could get powered up and get back on track. Um, I just happened to have last week off. I'm here in my tent in Mendocino Woods on my brother's property and got a call from Sonoma Water, I don't know, 3 a.m. or something. So. And then I could get the whole, you know, public engagement and um, information out from there to the water customers in Sonoma. So um, above and beyond, thank you so much, Sonoma Water, whole team. Thanks, Fergie. Um, unless there's any questions on infrastructure, I'll turn to the watershed and um, the impacts uh, to our um, potential impacts and, and risk assessment. Um, we've been very busy. Um, coming out of the wall bridge fire. Um, and um, as we did with 2017 and then in 2019 with the Kincaid, um, now um, Watershed Task Force Sonoma County under the leadership of the uh, ORR, Office of Resiliency and Recovery, developed a Watershed Task Force. It's a multi-agency uh, jurisdictional, um, really uh, a group uh, to get together and coordinate um, activities, post-fire activities and recovery activities and risk assessment. Um, I've been leading um, for the Watershed Task Force. Um, again, the, uh, the uh, team that's working on the um, hazard assessment and um, impact assessment and risk assessment. Um, and we have basically three groups, work groups, um, working on geohazards, that's um, 
impacts and hazards to public uh, life safety and public property, uh, public health, which is water quality, and then ecosystems. So we have three uh, teams that are working. This is not just Sonoma Water. There's National Marine Fisheries, there's Regional Board, uh, several county uh, departments, et cetera. And I'm talking about the Wallbridge fire right here. I'll, I'll pivot to the glass in a minute. Um, and so those activities and those teams are working together with CAL FIRE and their a watershed emergency response team or work team. Um, we have been working very closely with them. The WIRT report um, or the t report from the WIRT team is not out or public yet. We hope to have it. I'm hoping maybe later this week it's in re review at the upper levels of CAL FIRE. Uh, but we do know that um, kind of the general outcomes and the, re and the um, results of that. And um, essentially, it could have been a lot worse. The, there's really less than 1% of the Wallbridge fire that was a high burn severity. Uh, about 50% is um, moderate. And then about 25% is uh, low. And then about 25% is very low to low. And the um, part of the fire that drains into, in general, to Lake Sonoma is on the lower side of burn severity. The moderate is in the upper watersheds uh, in the central and southern part of the burn area up on the ridges. Um, and so um, of most concern right now are Mill Creek, <clears throat> Pena Creek, Porter Creek and the upper watersheds and then some of the upper watersheds to East Austin too. So we're looking at these and evaluating um, high risk uh, values at risk, VARS as they're called, and uh, we're compiling um, mitigation measures and recommendations from early warning systems and uh, signage uh, to other kinds of systems as well as uh, erosion control and any other kind of interventions um, and so that's what the whole watershed task force is doing. Our team is bringing that information and we're working with uh, the full watershed task force uh, uh, on that for a variety of response, um, um, mitigation responses to reduce risk from those three areas, public geohazards, water quality and ecosystems. Uh, from water quality, which obviously from the wall bridge where the footprint is, um, you know, we want to, I think out of an abundance of caution, um, we are instituting as we did in 2017 and 2019, um, a water quality sampling program. Um, this time, however, we're, we're looking at something a little bit more quicker turnaround, less, less of a researchy type thing to understand impacts to uh, wildfire and water quality, but really looking at just making sure that there's nothing a skew um, in a, a much more simpler and a quick turnaround on on um, analytical responses. And so we're working um, on developing that water quality plan. We've already gone out and taken some initial samples and um, we'll be working with the regional board and others too uh, on a more complete water quality program. Um, but the Sonoma water uh, water quality program will extend from Porter Creek, which is just above our diversion facilities, all the way through Lake Sonoma. And um, we'll be at watching these and monitoring this in real time or near real time uh, through this winter. Um, and then ecosystems, I, I do want to uh, call out ecosystems. I think everybody's aware that this is the wall bridge in particular really burned and devastated some um, significantly important um, uh, tributaries uh, to Dry Creek and the Russian River for Coho and especially and there's so there's been a lot of um, investments uh, in those systems and so uh, our ecosystem team which includes Sonoma Water, National Marine Fisheries, Fish and Wildlife, uh, the Corps and others is is out in the field looking at potential impacts and s mitigation measures that can be made uh, to improve the ecosystem and also to help protect our investments on Dry Creek too. So we're looking at all of this. So that's the wall bridge, it's very busy right now. As we're working on that, of course, the glass fire happens. Um, and yesterday we've been working on a new request for a work, um, 
a work team to be spun up by CAL FIRE. We've coordinated with Napa County. And yesterday we got out a letter to CAL FIRE requesting a work team be spun up to, for the glass fire. So we'll see what happens there. Um, we are also have worked on uh, signage. Many of you in, uh, have seen it because the signs are still up for the tubs and nuns fires, the signage we put up back then. We've uh, got new signage for both the wall bridge and the glass fires. I think a little bit improved uh, from the 2017 versions. And so I think those are, um, are under production right now. We'll get those out as soon as we can. We are very much working closely with our partners at Weather Service and Scripps looking at October, the potential atmospheric river October 9th and 10th um, and trying to assess what the impacts might be. Uh, positive or negative. Um, the forecasts have been jumping around a little bit now, so we're watching that uh, very closely. And then I, <clears throat> I would say that at least for the glass fire, um, we have, um, because it went right in between the tubs and the nuns, many of you will recall that Sonoma Water installed the Sonoma One Rain System, which is a series of stream gauges, soil moisture, and rain gauges that are linked to thresholds that the water that the weather service has for precip intensity and also uh, flood levels for the stage um, stream stages and that ha that system in general I think is going to serve us well also for the glass fire so in this case as opposed to the wall bridge or the Kincaid uh, we have a system in place that uh, helps with situational awareness and early warning. Um, this system is available to the public. We've had in the first 20 months of the one rain out coming out of 2017, we had over two and a half million hits on the system. It also is, uh, has alarm functions so that everybody can sign up uh, for uh, certain thresholds from certain rain gauges or stream gauges when levels hit certain thresholds uh, so that you can uh, get alarmed also. And so this, this system we do have in place continuing to operate. And I think that will serve as well, as I said, to um, for the glass fire. But there's going to be a lot of work continuing that we're just trying to get arms around now with the glass fire. I, I'll turn it back to you, Drew. That is a summary. Thanks, Jay. Uh, question, any other questions from the TAC on Jay's summary? Uh, Jay, I have a couple questions and maybe it's Jay slash Pam. Uh, first, first question is uh, just in terms of other, other sister water agencies with fire impacts, I mean, are you, do you know with Lake Berryessa with the fires, if, if some of the other um, water agencies were dealing with water quality impacts, dealing with, you know, the fires there and, and are different groups kind of coordinating in terms of lessons learned? I could, I've been coordinating with the Solano County Water Agency on Lake Berryessa and their supplies. So we have been uh, coordinating on their program. They were interested in what we've done to date. And so, yes, there is some um, coordination there, at least that I've been involved with, uh, including, you know, analyzing for fire suppressants too. Um, we've been coordinating with Cal Fire on that also in the US Geological Survey. Okay, thanks. And then my, the other question I had was just more of a logistics question with the Sonoma Wren booster station when it was, you know, uh, under threat, was there communication between SCWA staff and whoever was coordinating the firefighting response as far as having that as a, at a as a elevated critical facilities and did I assume that was probably happening but I was just curious did you did you notice that it had any uh, with that elevated status that there were additional personnel potentially assigned to protect that site or I, I was just curious hey Drew on, yeah. I think Stephen Hancock is on the call. I think he's been communicating most directly with the county during this. And in fact, was Stephen, are you able to chime in and add detail? 
Regina, we'd have to unmute Steve Hancock or. He should be able to unmute himself. He probably has stepped away from his desk. Oh, okay. Yeah, but there was close um, coordination with um, County De Department of Emergency Services in order to make sure that they knew that our highest priority was SBS. They were very aware of that from within probably an hour or two of the fire starting. And um, I don't think we have any knowledge of how they dealt with it in terms of personnel. We weren't out there because it was not a good place to be. So we don't have observation of what they did, but we know that we were at the top of their list in terms of infrastructure. Okay, thanks, Pam. Hey, Drew. Okay, we're gonna go. Drew, yeah. I, I would be remiss um, if I didn't mention that um, for the glass fire and our work request, our request for a work team that um, it was um, also co-signed by the city of Santa Rosa. So I wanted to mention that. All right, uh, we will open this now up to open time. Again, this is agenda item number four, Sonoma County Fire Update. Uh, if anybody from the public has a comment on this item to on Zoom, please raise your hand, or if you're part participating by phone, dial star nine. And I'll wait for Gina to report out. We do have one member of the public, David Keller. I'm gonna unmute you. Right. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, Jay, just wanted to follow up on the gauging information that you mentioned. Um, where is the access link for that? Or what is the access link for that? You, you, can, ac Go ahead. you can ac access that through our website or Google Sonoma One Rain. Sonoma One Rain. And the yeah. one is uh, as a number? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, what is one spelled out or is that this is a number? It's an O-N-E. O-N-E. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. If you have a problem, just shoot me an email and I'll make sure you get it. All right. Great. Thanks, Jay. Any other questions from the public on agenda item number four? I don't see any other hands. Thanks, Gina. Okay, we will move to agenda item, item number five, water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order. Uh, Pam or Don, who's gonna take the, I'll I'm let gonna, you two find it out. I'm gonna handle that one, Drew. Okay, Don, you're on. So good morning, everyone. This is Don Seymour, Sonoma Water. Um, so uh, Sonoma, Sonoma Water continues to manage releases from both the reservoirs and minimum stream flow requirements in accordance with the state board order issued at the end of July, <clears throat> uh, approving our temporary to change petitions. Um, that will continue through December 27th when the order expires. Um, there's no trigger that would terminate the order before then. So it'll continue, like I said, it'll continue to uh, December 27th. Um, just as a reminder, um, along with a number of other terms and conditions that were contained in the order, it approved Sonoma Water's uh, request to temporarily reduce minimum stream flow requirements in both the upper and lower Russian River. The request was to reduce minimum streams and minimum stream flows in the upper Russian River from 75 CFS to 50 CFS, and on the lower Russian River from 85 CFS to 60. Um, the real objective of, the, of those, those petitions and what we requested was to um, be at or near 40,000 acre feet of storage um, at the start of, uh, uh, in October. Um, we met that objective on October 1. We were just a tad under 40,000 acre feet. And so uh, that's good news. Um, the second objective was to, you know, along with having 40,000 acre feet of storage was trying to manage flows as close to the 75 CFS on the upper river and 85 CFS as possible. And if you were able, if you go to the USGS website and look at those flows, you'll see that during the majority of time since the order was approved, 
flows at both those uh, at both yields at Healdsburg has been near or above 75 CFS, and at Hacienda Bridge near or above 85. And really, what the order did it gave Sonoma Waters operations staff flexibility that when we were in some of these high demand periods and flows dipped down below those 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 flow below, below the 75 and 85 CFS. They didn't have to make releases from, from the reservoirs to chase those minimums, to bring them back up. And that really was what preserved uh, the storage in the reservoirs. So um, I think that's a good news. That's good news coming into the new water year. Um, currently, Lake Mendocino, the storage is at 39,465 acre feet. That's about 62% of uh, the target water supply storage curve. The release is 134 CFS and the flow at Healdsburg is a little above 80 cubic feet per second right now. For Lake Sonoma, the storage is, a, is about almost 178,000 or um, almost 180,000 acre feet, which is a little over 73% um, of the water supply pool. The release is 112 CFS and the flow at Hacienda Bridge is currently about 92 CFS. Um, just like to also add that uh, one of the drivers for Sonoma Water filing the temporary change petition was the variance that PGE filed to temporarily reduce flows of the Powder Valley project. Um, that uh, variant, that order that approved that variance from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission expired on October 1st because, uh, of, a, of a storage trigger. Storage at Lake Pillsbury was well above the, the trigger of 27,000 acre feet. So that will, re, that will result in, in inflows into Lake Mendocino being about 30 to 40 acre feet per day greater than we had assumed in our forecast back at the beginning of the summer. So that's gonna basically flatten out the, the, uh, the decline in, in Lake Mendocino a bit. So um, with that, I think uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be able to have them. I'll pass it back to you, Drew. Thanks, Don. Any questions from the TAC on Don's report? Uh, Don, again, just I want to thank the agency uh, for producing the regular graphs on water levels and based upon how the agency has managed Lake Mendocino this, this year, it looks like it's spot on uh, it have where we where the agency was at with Lake Mendocino in 2013 and, and it's higher levels than 2015 and and obviously um, the lowest uh, level there in 2014 so uh, good good informative information were you were you surprised with the overall storage this summer that that has been maintained in Lake Pillsbury by PG&E? Uh, to tell you the truth, you know, um, pretty early on, it, it appeared that uh, potentially some of their forecasts were, um, were a little um, overly conservative. And I would say in the June, July timeframe, I was pretty confident that their order would expire on October 1 because they were gonna have um, more storage than they had forecasted. Okay, all right. Hey, Drew, um, Drew yeah. this is Jay. I think another factor this year that we had in our favor was um, the uh, major deviation with the core, which resulted in about an extra 10,000 or so acre feet, even though we had the third driest year on record. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good point to reiterate that, Jay. Any other questions from the TAC before we go to the public? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll take public comments on agenda number agenda item number five: water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. Otherwise, if you're participating on phone, dial star nine. I don't see any raised hands, Drew. Okay, thank you, Gina. 
All right, we're going to move to item number six, biological opinion status update. And we do have an attachment on this one. Uh, and I believe, Pam, you're going to give the update. I am. Um, thanks, Drew. So hopefully, um, oh, well, there you go. You don't even have to have it in your hand. There's the copy of the, of the biological opinion update in front of you. Um, I'm going to... Um, really uh, try to cover changes again like I typically do and not read through this whole thing. So on the fish flow project, um, we, our staff continues to work towards um, creating a new draft of the environmental impact report uh, for recirculation. We expect um, to have that uh, ready for recirculation in the spring, um, not this year, but in the spring of 2021. And um, there is a lot of work going on right now with regards, it's not in the update here, but I know just from talking to Jessica and, and others that there's a lot of work going on right now, um, doing some modeling, both uh, flow modeling, water quality modeling, and there's some meetings that um, are workshops that are gonna be set up with the resource agencies to help us uh, educate them on um, our findings of all that work. Um, so that work is, is coming up right now, um, probably within, uh, it's probably, if I remember correctly, within this month, there's um, a, a couple of engagements um, to bring uh, the resource agencies up to speed on what's going on there. So that's what's going on with the fish flow project. On the Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement Project, we do have a contractor out there working right now. Right now it's Hanford ARC. And uh, they're working on the last remaining phase three project. Um, they've completed all the work in the active stream channel so that they can be out of the stream channel by the October 15th deadline, uh, which is a, a resource agency deadline. Um, they've uh, removed the temporary flow diversion and the dewatering measures from the creek already. And this is despite um, a, a delay of at least a week uh, due to the Wallbridge fire. So um, they've done really great work out there and have really put a lot of effort into it. So they are well positioned to finish the remaining work um, this year that they need to. They're also working on um, some work um, that's planned for 2021. Um, and they'll be doing that, of course, next year. Um, in addition to the, the new construction work this year, they've also done some maintenance work for us on um, previously completed projects, two projects specifically. Um, they've completed work on, maintenance work on, and they're working on the third of those maintenance projects right now um, and expect to have that done um, before, the end of, before the winter starts. Um, as as far as uh, work with the Corps of Engineers goes, um, they're making really good progress on what we call phases four through six. That's miles four through six that we're working on the Corps with. Um, we've reviewed and the Corps has reviewed the 99% design documents at this point and they're getting ready pr to prepare the bid package. Um, that will be for phase four, the first phase of the construction out there. We're also working on developing a formal uh, project partnership agreement or PPA as we call it, um, that describes the terms, roles, responsibilities of the construction effort, which is, which is led by the core. That um, project partnership agreement is actually going to our board for approval tomorrow. So um, that's very much a, a timely update there. Um, as far as mish, sorry, mish, fish monitoring goes, um, they've finished um, visual monitoring or surveys out in the small streams for this year. And now they're shifting um, their emphasis to electrofishing um, that uh, they use for both coho and steelhead um, so that they can mark those fish with pit tags or just the small tags that they insert in those fish so that we can monitor um, them, whether they're going out to the ocean or coming back from the ocean or in their stream, in the natal streams here. So that work is going on. Um, in August, um, they went out and did some sampling at um, three 
sites that were enhanced on Dry Creek, three sites that were not enhanced on Dry Creek, um, so that they can tell what's going on, the difference of how the use of those enhancement sites is for the fish. Um, and I won't get into this. If anybody wants more detail about that, they can read this. We, um, as I think everybody knows, we also operate, <clears throat> excuse me, fish counting stations at our seasonal dam that's um, at Mirabel. And uh, video cameras were installed in September um, on the west side of, of the dam. And they were, uh, it was installed a little bit later on, the, on September 3rd on the east side of the dam. Um, the video is um, being recorded and they've reviewed video through September 15th on the west side, September 24th on the east side and have seen just a few fish, namely seven steelhead and two salmonids that they um, couldn't identify. So um, that's what's going on there. Uh, Rush River Estuary Management Project, uh, we're getting close to the end of the management season, which ends on October 15th. Um, the river mouth closed on September, September 28th, and as of this morning, it's still closed. We, however, uh, it's a very slow rise in, in water surface elevation behind the beach. Um, so we have not planned um, any sort of uh, beach management action, or we haven't scheduled one, I should say. Um, we're continuing, continuing to monitor conditions out there and um, including doing water quality monitoring work, et cetera. That's been ongoing all summer. So um, the last item on here is interim flow changes. And I think Don covered that really well in his update um, on water supply um, conditions and the temporary urgency change order. So I will skip that unless there's any questions. I'm done, Drew. Thank you, Pam. Questions from the TAC on Pam's report? Pam, um, couple, I have a couple questions on the Dry Creek Enhancement Project. So am I correct then that this, this summer's job with Hanford, will this be the last project that will actually be put out to bid by directly by the agency and then the rest of the projects through phases four, five, and six will be put out by the Army Corps? That's my understanding because I think they bid that piece that's still left for next summer, they bid it this year. So um, yeah, that's my understanding. Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think you're correct. Okay, well, that'll be, a, I would think that'll be a welcome surprise for, for some of the SCWA staff to not have to, to be able to rely on the core to move forward with some of these future projects, because each, each of these projects is a huge time commitment, obviously, and it must help by having uh, the core step up. And um, now I was glad to hear that the maintenance project work was done. Was there any off-haul of sediment as part of that project? And do you know where that the spoils were reused or? Okay, well, I'm assuming there was off-haul since they were getting it out of the creek, but I don't I don't know where it went, Drew. Sorry. Okay. All right. And then on the fish monitoring, you had indicated that, and I, I realize David Manning isn't here on on the Zoom this morning about the uh, three habitat enhancement sites were monitored in August and three unenhanced. Did you, did you hear at all whether there was any uh, determination of the numbers of fish in one versus the other? Or? I, I haven't heard any um, data, uh, any of the, you know, sort of summary of that so far. I don't know if anybody else on the phone has heard me, but I have not heard any, any specifics on that yet. Okay. And then do you know when the next report will be just on terms of the overall uh, update on the whole Dry Creek enhancement? I mean, the, P, the PPI, PPFC is traditionally been uh, that avenue. I know, I know that that was postponed 
Is that being discussed? I heard from Barry not too long ago, it seemed like there still was in some flux on when that might be rescheduled. Yeah, and it is still in flux at this point. There hasn't been any determination made about that, but there will definitely, definitely be an update at that meeting. Um, the other thing that's available is there's, you know, annual reports done on the BO. And I know that they're not exactly up to date at this point. In other words, they're probably still working on 2019's report, but um, there should be some information in those also. Okay. Uh, thank you. Those are the only questions I have. So we'll, we'll go ahead and move to uh, public comment on this item. Again, this is agenda item number six. Anybody from the public that's participating via Zoom, if you can raise your hand or if you're participating via phone, hit star nine. I do not see any raised hands for this item. Okay, thanks Gina. So that takes us to item number seven, Potter Valley Project Relicensing Update. Uh, Pam, you're on a roll. Okay, um, so in, in August, I'm going to go back to August. I know we're right at the beginning of October now, but in, in August, there were comments due on scoping document three. That was the scoping document that was issued by FERC at the end of July. Um, I believe the contractors got comments in um, on that scoping document. So uh, we did hear last week from uh, our FERC project manager, that uh, they will be issuing a scoping document for, so they're working on that right now, just so folks know. Um, we filed, the partnership filed an initial study report, which is essentially an update of where all the studies are at, sort of uh, status of the, update, of the studies. And of course, we haven't done any study work yet, so it was essentially, uh, a status update on what PG&E had completed before they stopped working on the project um, from a, a relicensing standpoint. So we filed that in accordance with the schedule that we're under in mid-September. Two weeks later, we held a meeting that was just last week. Um, it was called the Initial Study Report Meeting. And uh, it was an all day meeting. It was very well attended. Uh, we did it via Zoom. Um, uh, some, you know, it's hard to do a long day like that on Zoom, but it worked out okay. I'm sure that folks would have liked to have had a little bit more back and forth, but um, all in all, I think everybody was pretty happy with the meeting. Um, in about a week, in a little over a week from now, we are uh, required, the partners are required to file an initial study report meeting summary with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So we will take all of the questions and comments that we received during the meeting last week, uh, summarize them and address them as, a, as uh, appropriate, um, either in changing studies or saying why we're not gonna change studies or just uh, responding to those. So that will come out next week. Um, about a month after that, in mid-November, any of the stakeholders, including the, the partnership that we belong to, um, can file um, both comments on the initial study report and any differences in what they see um, in terms of our meeting summary. So in other words, if we haven't addressed something the way they want to see it addressed, at that point, they can make that comment. So there's sort of two rounds of this coming. One is mid-November, one is mid-December. And uh, once those two rounds of uh, requesting either additional studies or, or pointing out differences uh, occur, in mid-January is when the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is supposed to uh, file or supposed to issue, excuse me, a study plan determination and also comments on the differences that were filed. So, um, <clears throat> so mid-January is a very big date in terms of um, a FERC 
uh, issuance of a document that will tell the partnership what they expect them to do over the next um, year or more. So um, that's what's coming up sort of in the, in the immediate time frame. Once that uh, study plan determination is issued, that's when the studies themselves will start again. So um, they've been on hiatus since the time that PG&E filed their withdrawal of relicensing. So um, that's where we're at right now. That's sort of the, it's a very tight time frame between now and mid-January for all these things to happen. And they're occurring um, in accordance with the integrated licensing process uh, timeline. So there's a very specific timeline number of days that you're given um, in between each of these things. And that's, that's what's driving the schedule right now. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, Pam. Questions from the TAC on Pam's report? Uh, one thing I would like to just follow up with what uh, Pam summarized that uh, with this initial study report, there are two new studies. One was Scott Dam re removal and the other one is social socioeconomics. Um, and so I would anticipate that uh, the the WAC will probably be submitting some comments on the social socioeconomic study and do that prior to the November 14th deadline. And then as Pam had indicated, uh, you know, with FERC issuing scoping document number four, that should include their comments or their responses to the comments, which included uh, our WAC's um, various comments that were submitted a couple of months ago. So there's, as Pam has always indicated, it's a very prescriptive process. There's a lot of uh, milestones along the way and, and uh, multiple opportunities for providing comments. So I think um, I expect that we'll be, again, meeting this November 14th deadline for comments on the newly, newly released socioeconomic study. So with that, I'll go ahead and open this to open to uh, for public comment. And again, this is agenda item number seven. So if anybody participating on Zoom has a has a question, please raise your hand. Or if you're participating via phone, uh, hit star nine. Drew, I don't see any raised hands for this item. Thank you. Uh, we'll move now to agenda item number eight, emergency training and coordination subcommittee uh, summary. And that's going to be provided by Stephen Hancock, Sonoma County Water Agency. Stephen? Yeah, good morning, Drew. Thank you. Um, and good morning, members of the TAC and public. Um, I don't want to go too far over following Pam's lead, um, just kind of re regurgitating the document you have up in front of you on display. But what I want to do is just give you an update on the emergency training committee and um, some of the actions we've taken to date. So since we've put together the emergency training and coordination subcommittee, um, we've met three times. And a lot of that is kind of just getting a feel for what we want to work on and what are some of the more higher priority areas that, that really kind of deserve some immediate attention. Through those meetings, we've come up with these eight project ideas, kind of bucketing them into these categories or, or ideas that really reflect a variety of things. Um, overarching systems that establish interoperability down to individual training and resources. So some of them are a little bit more turnkey, uh, low hanging fruit, if you will, while some of them are much more complex and will take some time and the work of some other agencies to put into reality. Um, the bottom line of it is we went through with our meeting last week, we went through this list of ideas. And while you don't have this update in front of you, I can kind of talk through it really quickly. We did go through with the emergency training committee and prioritize and ranked all of these projects of what they 
the members of that represent the TAC, what they feel is probably the most critical and timely for us to focus on. Um, and overwhelmingly, it was communications, the not so much the public information aspects, but the risk communications, the communications plan side of things. So that rose to the top, that'll be our kind of first area of focus. And when I'm talking about um, emergency communications, it's really how are we communicating at the field level over to the management level and even building in what redundancies, radio networks we have that we can lay as a web over that. If you think about it, we it's taking that emergency contractor or water contractors coordination call um, that Barry has so excellently facilitated over the last many months um, and putting that on some additional enhancements and, and really building that out. So that's going to be the group's agreed upon primary focus. Uh, next to that, we really want to look at establishing that resource inventory system where we can kind of just catalog what are the shareable resources we have within our shared network that we can provide to each other if needed for immediate turnkey res response. Um, and then really rounding off the top three from the priorities, uh, it's gonna be training. And there was, it's training from how do we respond at the field level and providing field level, if it's kind of a modified incident command system type training to department operation centers and emergency operation centers. All of this is really going to what we're gonna be kind of, you'll hear probably more regularly is establishing this common operating picture. Um, that is uh, an emergency management slash Homeland Security industry standard, where the goal of establishing common operating pictures is to really kind of provide effective decision-making, real-time situational awareness and sharing of information across multiple agencies. So all of these things kind of lead the development of what we're gonna call a common operating picture. Um, that's gonna be something that we're gonna to have to work with the County Department of Emergency Management as well as Marin County Office of Emergency Services to kind of really flesh that out and what that can look like for us. Um, but that's kind of a, an end all where we wanna to get to. Um, all of these things are gonna add up to becoming part of our common operating picture but really the goal being is what the grand jury has highlighted and what this group has already recognized the value in is putting us in a position where we can effectively identify risk, communicate in a timely way, share resources and support each other to establish that resiliency and redundancy. So that's, that's what the group's working towards. Now that we have these project ideas, we're gonna take the top three and flesh those out into a little bit more of a specific project timeline and what those will be. And then we'll be bringing those updates back to the TAC. I can suspect that with the communications plan being the first priority, there might be some opportunities for doing some communications investment um, across all of our agencies, but we wanna kind of work that through in the subcommittee before we bring back any recommendations to the TAC with that. Um, with that, Drew, that's, that's all I have, uh, unless you have any questions. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, questions from the TAC on Stephen's report? So just to remind everybody, Stephen is the uh, chair of the subcommittee that was recently formed, the Emergency Training and Coordination Subcommittee. Stephen, I just want to, again, thank you and, and all your committee members from each agency on uh, all the work that's been done to date. And it seems like we're just going from one emergency to another. So all, all of this subcommittee's efforts are definitely uh, timely and, and looking forward to uh, continued and improved coordination um, and the outcome. Hey, Drew. Yes. I have Margie. a quick question for Stephen, hopefully. So Stephen, um, as part of you know all of this, is there someplace in here a conversation about um, a scenario you know, where we, we work all this stuff out and then we actually practice it. I think that's gonna be built in all of it. Um, I think every single one of those project ideas builds in a training aspect to it uh, and an exercising aspect. Cause really for us to get to the point where we can say, we're gonna implement this and institutionalize this as a new way of doing it, we have to exercise it. So that's, that's kind of my approach to things. Um, so even developing a, a risk communications plan we're gonna to have to exercise that to, to validate some of the assumptions we put into there. So you can just kind of count on that being part of every single project as we move forward. 
That's great to hear, Stephen. We have so many plans that sit on the shelf, and then when the emergency happens, we're like, "Where's that plan?" We really need to yeah. practice. So it, it, I'm I'm happy to hear that that is in the mix. Cool. Any other questions from the TAC? Stephen, before I open it up for public comment, do you want to just provide a, a quick summary of what we we will be bringing back to the next meeting, the WAC TAC meeting on November 2nd, regarding just a, an overview of the after, the after action review on the fires and COVID-19? Yeah, thank you for that, Drew. Um, so as this group, going back to, I think, what was the aqueduct repair, um, but then we transitioned quickly into regular coordination meetings during the COVID response, the COVID-19 pandemic response, as well as then going into the lightning fire complex, specifically the Wallbridge fires. And then we went into whatever the disaster was of the week. Uh, we seem to be getting together fairly regularly to talk about it and share information and coordinate our, each other's activities. Um, for me, it's important. And for the water agency, it's important to really capitalize on, on what are the successes of those experiences, but then what are the opportunities for improvement? So we did conduct a, an online, a virtual after action review with the water contractors, specifically to talk about the coordination, the sharing of information, and then what were some of the opportunities for improvement that we can kind of build upon. Um, so what we're gonna bring back at the November WAC meeting will be a kind of presentation, a summary report of that after action review, um, capturing what, what, where the successes were and where people felt we were, had some strengths collectively, but then what were some of those opportunities for improvement we can build upon? And I'll be having my um, member of my team, Michelle Maxwell will be joining us to facilitate that presentation. Great, thanks, Stephen. Okay, we'll move to, uh taking public comments this is agenda item number eight if you're participating in the zoom and have a question please raise your hand or hit star nine if you're uh, participating via phone drew i don't see any members of the public with their hand raised all right thanks gina okay so we're coming to a close here last item agenda number nine uh, topics for the next agenda. We will, again, this will be a WAC TAC meeting November 2nd, obviously another Zoom meeting. Um, it'll be, it'll have our regularly reoccurring uh, WAC agenda items. It'll include what Stephen has just summarized uh, for that after action review. Um, it'll also include most likely a FERC comment letter for submission um, by the November 14th deadline related to the initial study report. Is there anything else that folks wanted to have on the agenda? Okay, seeing nothing, we'll, we'll go to the public for item number nine. If you have a comment on Zoom, please raise your hand or hit star nine via phone. Drew, I have a hand raised by Paul Piazza. I'm going to allow you to talk. Hello, Paul. You there, Paul? Gina, I don't see Paul Piazza or yeah. hear him. He's unmuted. Um, let me try and bring him in as a panelist, just one moment. Paul, are you there? I am, are you able to hear me at this point? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. All right. Sorry for the tech issue. Just wanted to mention, Drew, in terms of another agenda item for the upcoming WAC TAC, uh, the partnership received two additional awards from the EPA Water Sense. One was an additional sustained excellence award for the QUEL program. The other was a 
Excellence Award for promotional um, efforts for water sense labeled products. So just want to make sure we get that added to the agenda. Um, this year is a little different in that typically those awards are received in person at the Water Smart Innovations Conference in Las Vegas each year. And then um, as we bring those back, we're able to uh, together a photo opportunity for WAC members in person. But this year being what it is, uh, we'll have to come up with a workaround. They're going to be mailing the awards to us. I'm hoping to have them in hand uh, in a week or two. And um, we could potentially get a screenshot of WAC members accepting the award on Zoom for submission to the EP. Uh, we can work that out. But I, I just wanted to share the good news, make sure that we're adding that as uh, an item for the WAC to receive. Great. It's a great idea. Thanks, Paul. Anything else before we adjourn? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, everybody. Remember, uh, next meeting, WACTAC, uh, November 2nd via Zoom. And again, thanks to Gina and Easter for all your work and putting these on. So, uh, everybody, I hope you have a good week. Thanks, Bruce.